way to change this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello, my sisters. It's so awesome to be here with you guys tonight. Um, Fernando and I were really, really excited to have the Thrive join you guys, uh, join LA, and then see everyone from all the other churches. We're so excited to be here with you guys. And uh, thank you, Sarah, for giving me the opportunity to share <laughs> tonight, to share God's word, obviously. Um, and it's also awesome to be here with Therese and to be here with Sharon. And um, you guys are, we love you guys. You guys are mothers in the faith uh, to a lot of us. And we're just so grateful for you guys. Um, and so many of my friends here. <laughs> you know, it's really awesome to be here uh, with a lot of you guys that I admire so much and that I, I, you know, strive to imitate as well. So I love you guys. Okay, so let's start in the beginning. <laughs> Let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. To the beginning. Genesis 2. And we're going to start in verse 18. Now I'm going to read in the NLT version. But you guys can follow along. Okay, so it says, The Lord said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So, okay, up to this point, everything is good. <laughs> the creation is good. Animals are good. They're all named and good. The only thing that is not good is that Adam is alone. So God says, I will make a helper suitable for him. Okay, so the title of my lesson for tonight is Blessed to be a Helper. Blessed to be a Helper. <laughs> And maybe some of you are like, yay. <laughs> Helper? Whoopee! <laughs> I mean, what comes to your mind when you hear the word helper? Right? Does it, it doesn't really sound like much. Helper? It makes me think of hamburger helper. I don't know if I'm I don't know if I'm like dating myself with this, but I used to love hamburger helper when I was little. Now uh, not so much, okay? But um to some, the idea of being a helper or an assistant, it's like yeah, I want to be an assistant. I want to be a helper. You know, that you kind of want to be that role. But to some, you know, others, it's like, I don't really want to be an assistant. Like, I don't really want the helper role, you know, so much. But guys, if ever there was a word that is mostly misunderstood or not translated correctly, is the word helper. Okay? It's a word that requires deeper study to grasp the depth of its meaning. And to a lot of you, this is something that you already know, <laughs> but I want to remind everyone tonight, including myself, what God wanted our role to be, okay? What he wanted our role to be like. So the Hebrew word for helper is azer, okay? Some I was hearing some pronouncing, uh, like the Hebrew way of pronouncing it is azer. Is there. <laughs> but <laughs> then some pronounce it Ezer or, uh, you know, but I will say Azer because I heard that that's also correct. So I will keep it as Azer. Um, and uh, I checked that they're both correct. So guys, there's 21 scriptures that use this word and we won't be able to go through all of them. But if you want, I have like an image document, like an image and I can send it to you guys. It talks about all the Azer scriptures and their meaning and I can send that to you. Okay. So we'll just go over a couple of them today. Um, but out of those 21 times that Azer appears, uh, it is best translated as warrior. So two times describing the woman, three times referring to a military aid, and 16 times it's in reference to God as the helper of his people, yeah. delivering them, protecting them like a warrior in battle and saving them. So the word helper in Hebrew actually means to rescue to save, to be strong. It's, it also means the eye that sees danger. And the other part of helper in the Hebrew word is konegdo. Together, it is what makes suitable helper or help meet. Okay? Because sometimes you guys, I'm sure, have heard that, help meet. So konegdo means an ally in the battle. And also, it means a roadblock. A roadblock, but not in a bad way. Okay, 
meaning she will be his strongest ally in pursuing God's purposes wow. and his first roadblock when he veers off course. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. So this is powerful because when God saw Adam in the garden, he didn't think, let me give you a woman who will clean up the house. The house. I mean, they were, they were you know, in the garden. <laughs> let me give you a helper who's going to wash your clothes. They were naked. <laughs> okay? <laughs> let me get you a helper to take care of the children. What children? They didn't have any children yet. Okay? So, I mean, you guys need to just still do all that. Okay? But this is not what <laughs> it, it really means. Okay? Let's look at it deeper. So, God knew that there was an enemy because he had kicked him out of heaven. So, he knew there was an enemy. So, he was giving Adam an azer that would defend, that would protect, that would surround a helper that saves. That's powerful. As women, married or single, because I'm not just talking to the married women here, married or single, we have been created to follow and to lead as an azer. We were imaged after God himself and given the, the ability to help, given the ability to help in the way that God helps. And that's powerful because he's, he fights for us. He wins battles. So we are called to be warrior helpers. Come on. So my point, uh, first point is you are not your greatest azer. You are not your greatest azer, okay? Let's turn to Psalm 146. It's too quiet in here. Come on, guys. What's going on here? Okay. Psalm 146. Psalm 146, verse 3. It says, Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, their God. The NLT version says, joyful are those whose help is God. And the message version says, happy are those whose help is God. Okay, so let's keep reading in verse 7. It says, He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrated the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. So the passage here is really clear, right? It actually lists everything. <laughs> Blessed are those whose azer is God. Amen. It's very straight out. <laughs> when he is your greatest azer, you can uphold the oppressed. When he is your azer, you can feed the hungry. You can lift up those who are weighed down. That is why it says blessed. Blessed are those who whose help is the Lord. They're not begrudgingly doing things. Rather, they joyfully, superlatively happy are able to do it, to give food to the hungry, to help set prisoners free. He lists all these things, to give sight to the spiritually blind, to lift up those who are weighed down, to love the righteous, to help watch over the foreigners through special missions and sending people, to sustain the fatherless and the widows, and to frustrate the ways of the wicked, Come on. they are able to do a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Come on, Jackie. <laughs> do Come you on. believe that you can do this? Come on. Come on. That's awesome. Come on. Well, you can't. If <laughs> your azer is not God. Wow. You won't. Nice. And if you right. do it, you will get really weighed down <laughs> yeah. if you try to do it without That's God right. as being your help. Come on. Yeah. Right. But if he is your help, right. nothing is impossible when God yes. is your azer. Yeah. Yeah. And there's implications for not understanding this. Wow. If we do not see what God's role is supposed to be in our lives, then we begin to question. Mm -hmm. We begin to hesitate. Mm -hmm. We'll linger yeah. because we won't, we won't live, we won't lead, we won't love right. beyond right. what we believe about God or about ourselves. Right. It'll be limited. And I wonder what things aren't happening because we've wrestled with our own strength in God. 
what churches aren't being planted, what groups are not flourishing, what ministries are being started like CR or life skills, what ICC and master's degrees aren't being obtained, what books, what blogs, what posts, spiritual posts that aren't being done. What lives of people that aren't being saved because we haven't fully taken our role as women in the kingdom of God. Come on, Jackie. Come on. But I also wonder where there are women who are burned out. Who are burned out because they're carrying something that they weren't ever meant to carry alone. And I'm not saying alone because of because you need your husband. No. God is your azer. God is your azer, not your husband. Are you burning out in your role? Then you need to ask the question, is God really my azer? Turn with me to Luke 10. Luke 10, verse 38. Luke 10, 38. Very, very, you know, common scripture, but we need to always hear it again. Okay, it says, as they traveled along, Jesus entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to his message. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations to be made. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. (laughs) Martha, Martha, the Lord replied, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion and it will not be taken from her. Martha didn't need help in the kitchen. (laughs) She needed help from the Messiah. We are rescued by our beautiful relationship with God, with our creator, right? And that's so much better than having a sister help us in the kitchen. Some of us focus on what we think our life is lacking. Like Martha. I don't have a husband that's like yours. I don't have a husband like that. I don't have a campus girl to work with. I don't have a nanny like others do. No, sis. You can have a nanny and still be stressed out. Getting a nanny is not the answer. Your problem would only be masked and not solved. Your limitation is your attitude towards what you think you are lacking in your life. We need to first start with our creator, our number one azer, the God Almighty. And then we will see that in reality, we're not really lacking anything. God must be our greatest azer or we'll never be one for someone else. So first some practicals, okay? Your schedule must reflect who your greatest azer is. Mm -hmm. Have a consistent routine that works and don't make excuses for it, okay? (laughs) And this is gonna look different for everybody, okay? Like some of you guys are not married, some of you guys have one child, some of you guys have two, some of you guys have three. So it's gonna look different, okay? So I'm saying get something that works for you. Mine is we have three kids at three different schools, okay? So, (laughs) with one car. (laughs) So we have a small window of opportunity to make this happen and get them to school on time. (laughs) Fernando drops me off with Vivi at her school, and then um, I convince her to go in. And then, (laughs) that may take a while, but after that, then I have my prayer walk to a coffee shop. What coffee shop, you ask? Pete's, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I get a piece and I read and I write in my gratitude journal. And you probably, maybe some of you guys are saying, I don't have the money to buy coffee every day. Ah, uh, well then you need to ask the Lord of Armies to give, make it happen because I did not pay for my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask some of the disciples, uh, you know, especially at Pete's, they get three coffees a day. Who's going to drink three coffees a day? That's sin. So they give me one of their free coffees, okay? Or share with the people there. They'll give you their free coffee. Okay, anyway, plus I only get one shot of espresso on ice and then I just put my protein coffee in there. So pray to the Lord of hosts. Okay, 
So you you just make it happen with that. Then, or you can just get water or just make your coffee at home. Amen. Yeah, just bring it. Okay. So, and then I end up reading, having my time there. And then I, I have another prayer walk and I go to the gym. I walk to the gym. And then, um, so I can go 20 minutes, 20 minutes or an hour, depending on if they have a class. And, um, and then Fernando and I have about, you know, 12 three times a week, I think. And then we have, <laughs> and then we have, uh, you know, lesson preps and then we have meetings. So our day, you know, begins after that. But guys, there's just, you just got to see what works for you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's Come just, it, it's going to look different, but you just got to do it. Yeah. Make no excuse to just have your time with God, to pray to God, to take care of your health. And uh, number two, have something fresh and new to dig to, to dig in, okay? Have a book. I, I buy a lot of books, okay? Go Prime. Fernando doesn't really mind because he knows that this helps me. This helps me keep, you know, God is my azer. I buy a lot of books or, um, or you know, um, borrow books. And um, I found one book. It was like a dollar something. On, you can find them really cheap. So find ways to also, number three, preach what you are learning, okay? Even if you're not doing a midweek lesson, right. preaching cements God as your azer. Like, do this in your D times, do this in, uh, you know, D groups with, you know, that's, you need to, to teach what you're learning and it helps cement that. Okay, so find something that works for you and make it happen. Point number two, um, azer, own your role. Own your role. Okay, let's read uh, in Judges 4. So we're gonna we're gonna go quickly through Deborah. Okay. So Judges chapter four, verse four. So it says, Now Deborah a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. Um, and the Israelites went up to, to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinam, Abinam from Kadesh in Naphtali, um, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take with you 10,000 men of, Na uh, I think it's Naphta Naphtali, yeah, Naphtali, and Zebulun, and then, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. <laughs> Certainly, I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There uh, Barak sum summoned Sebulun and Naphtali. Naphtali. And then, um, then 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went up with him. Okay, so some facts about Deborah. She's the only female judge. She wasn't just the only uh, woman to be a judge, but she was also um, a prophetess, okay? So only her and Samuel had this, uh, you know, these roles of being both a judge and a prophetess, which is pretty cool. So we can only imagine what people were thinking, you know, about her being a judge. Like, she's like the first and only judge. And they're probably, you know, I don't know what they were talking about her, maybe to her or about her as she's trying to embrace something that's different, mm -hmm. you know, right. as she's trying to embrace what God is doing in her life. Right. Yeah. So God placed her in that role. Mm -hmm. right. We all have a place. Yeah. We, Come on. our own place, okay, right. on, which God himself has destined as our spot in which he desires for us to walk in. Mm -hmm. Come on. And I've had the opportunity to speak to many different women who have felt maybe a calling, you know, to that they say, oh, you know, I feel like God has called me to do a certain thing, maybe do ministry, but yet they struggle to embrace it yeah. because of various reasons. Yeah. Right. And maybe they sent them to me because when, when Fernando wanted to do ministry, I didn't want to do the ministry. So maybe someone told them and that's why they're coming to me. But there are different reasons for each of these women, you know, some were afraid of the changes that would be necessary in their lives to do what God was asking them to do. And some just flat out didn't trust that maybe that was their calling. But with Deborah, God had placed her under a palm tree. 
and this was her place, right? She's right now she's under a palm tree serving as a judge and a prophetess, right? Mm -hmm. If God has placed you in a particular place for a particular role, then are you in it? Mm -hmm. Come on. Not only that, because you can be in a role and not really be owning it. Yeah. Right, right. Are you owning where God has you? We see Deborah, Mrs. Lapidoth, okay, was going about her business of administering justice. When God asked her to change gears a little bit, yeah. he says, I need you to change your role. Mm. You know, I need you to leave your little comfortable palm tree and lead Israel out of bondage after 20 years. So these people are so used to something going the way that it's been going. But God is asking her to change gears. Okay? As the new leader of the Israelites, God is asking Deborah to act, to save, to be an azer to her people. And he says this by saying, awake, awake, Deborah. This is what he says. And I looked this up and it means to admire and praise the Lord. Wow. It was like, Deborah, turn your gaze to me. Admire me more than your life or your job that you think that you wanted or your degree that you thought that you needed. Turn your gaze and praise me, the Lord Almighty. Praise God with your calling. And the scripture contains really no record of her negotiating with God (laughs) or saying, Choose me as your last resort, please. <laughs> she didn't rationalize this in any way. Like, uh, I, don't, I don't think that I'm the one for this job, you know? Like, yeah. there are other w- women much better than me that they could be up here right. speaking. Or she's not, like, thinking, can we try this again later when my baby's <laughs> older? Um, <laughs> right? Like, no. Like, Deborah was told by God to deliver, you know, th- to, to deliver a military victory to Israel. Yeah. So she immediately responded in faith to her assignment. And it is important for us to see that a part of owning your role is growing in your role. The enemy wants us immature and stuck in the same place underneath the palm tree. (laughs) Because if he stops growing us, he can control us. You see, Deborah, she doesn't stay there. She decides to grow and she finds a way to make this happen you know she wasn't like the best at military skills right right yeah. but she got someone that was right, right. <laughs> she, right? she made it happen yeah. Come on. you know it, it says that they had 10,000 and then um Cicero had 900 chariots I mean that's those odds are pretty <laughs> pretty bad <laughs> yeah. so Deborah the prophetess confidently told Barak that if they would deploy the troops against Sisera, that this pagan commander and his army would come out to fight, but that God would defeat them all. She was so confident. Deborah had heard what God was calling her to do, and she owned her role. She moved forward in faith, and she was an an um, Ezer warrior. She didn't let anything stop her. So what are you expecting in your life in 2024? What are you expecting in your ministries? What are you expecting in your marriage? What are you expecting with your children? Are you trying to rationalize your way out of what God is calling you? Or what God is not calling you to? You know, uh, Fernando and I, we were baptized um, as teens in the 90s. I'm pretty old. (laughs) I feel old. There was was a point where where we were in the ministry, and in 2003, um, it was just a dark time, not just in our lives, but just in the movement, too. And um, Fernando decided to step down from the ministry. And uh, we weren't married at the time when it happened, but so I was a little, like, taken back. Like, why would he want to step down at ministry? But I, I kind of felt like, oh, it's okay. Like, it's fine then. I'll just make it work, right? I'll just do what I need to do. And um, I was thinking about it, and I was like, was I really okay with it? Was I really okay that he wanted to step down min- out of ministry? And I mean, it was 20 years ago, so it's kind of hard to, to think <laughs> about that now. But it came up again because we had a conversation with someone recently. And uh, Fernando said to the brother that, that they, as brothers, they need to lead their wives and, and be resolute in their role. Because 
the woman may just not not really go after it her, her role and i was like that's not good <laughs> that's not good i was like so for those of you guys right now who are married if your husband didn't want to be in the ministry anymore if you wanted to step down from leading you know a church a ministry a bible talk or any capacity yeah. would that automatically take you out wow. think about it would you still do the ministry would you be like fine better for me i won't wow. lead oh, come on, come on, Jack. and you got to be honest yeah, do you believe that this is god's calling for you right. and that he's placing you in this seat right. because if you would just drop it wow. that may mean that you never truly wanted it that's right wow. preach this jackie yeah. preach and this. this is so important because yeah. your husband isn't the only one that's called right. Yeah. You on. and I are called to. Yes. That's right. You are called to be an Azer Connecto. Oh. So recently, we, we just um, sadly saw a, some couples, and for me, I, I saw some wives not being an Azer Connecto. Um, and remember what it means. It means an ally in the battle and the first roadblock to redirect to the right path. Okay. Yeah. So in those situations, their husbands were talking a little weird. Yeah. <laughs> They were saying some things and they're like, no, they don't want to be in the ministry anymore. And they were breathing out faithlessness wow. and criticalness right. Right. and resentment. Mm. Right. You could tell that maybe they were, that they were struggling spiritually. Right. And maybe no one else saw it in these brothers. Right. But her wife, mm. their wife saw it. Oh I'm right. sure their wife saw it. <laughs> because an azer is the eye that sees danger right. yeah right right these women were not the first roadblock right. as wow. they veered off god's course they weren't wow. they didn't say hey and i spoke to two of these sisters personally okay mm -hmm. they did not say hey let's pray together hey we need to forgive or we need to focus on the scriptures or let's sit down with so and so or you know let's Come do on. what's right let's not give satan a foothold they didn't say that they followed their husbands right into destruction. Wow. 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 Come on. We need to be that roadblock, yeah. that Azer Connecto, wow. where in some way, shape, or form, you're like, hey, you're praying on your knees, you're fasting, you're, you're making it happen, you contact disciples, you do whatever it takes, you fast, you know? Um, and it just, it, it's just not good to not be an ally in the That's battle right. yeah. you need to walk alongside and help yeah. like really That's help right, so sisters write down what you think god is asking of you and thank him mm. Come on. Jackie, preach. Come on, Jackie. thank him for Come on. it Come on. thank him for choosing you thank him for believing in you Thank him for trusting you with right. the souls of so many, including That's your right. husbands, yeah. including yeah. your kids, That's including right. your friends, including the lost. Sisters, right. fellow Azers, own your role in the kingdom of God. Okay, so point number three, short and uh, last point. Azer, nail the enemy. Nail the enemy. So let's keep reading in, in the same chapter. Are we in the same chapter? In Judges chapter four. Yeah. Jackie, awesome. Verse 17. Come on. Come on, Come on. Judges 4, verse 17. So we're going to keep reading. It says, Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber the Kenite, Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent. And she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. <laughs> Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone in there, say no. But J.L. Heber's wife picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he laid fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. <laughs> Whenever I read that, I'm like... <laughs> so, <laughs> J.L. In, in verse 17, 
it points out that Jael's husband had an alliance. He was a friend with King Jabin. This isn't good, right? Her husband was on the fence with God's people and with the enemy. So Jael's husband was struggling or definitely not doing well in his convictions. But what did this produce in his wife? How is JL affected by this? Was JL on the fence too? Was JL struggling too with her personal convictions? No. It says that JL used a nail to put through the enemy's head and killed him. And I can picture JL, okay? She's getting the nail. Something that she's used to getting many times because she's a nomad. She, she would, her family would move from place to place and she would pitch tents wherever she would go. And this job was for the woman. So she was so used to getting these pegs and putting them on the ground. She was used to t- pitching her tent. God had been preparing her all along for such a time as this. So she's there and she's trying to reach for something and I'm thinking like her heart's probably racing right like (laughs) like something could go like what could go wrong I mean maybe he could wake up or yeah like what will happen what will my husband think the bloody mess I know (laughs) yeah I know Courtney's thinking that cleaning up she pushes the nail with so much force that it goes through this man's head into the ground. So it's not like she's like, clink, 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 clink. No, she's like, bam. (laughs) But what does this say? It says that she wasn't sentimental with the sin in her life. What sin do you have what sin do you see in your life today that you've allowed to stay in your tent Mm. where you're just like keeping it there all snugly in your tent instead of just putting a blanket over it god wants us to put a nail through it he wants us to nail it to the cross you know um uh, you know, a, a nail, uh, I was trying to find a connection and the nail that went through Jesus' yeah. feet yeah. And, and his wrists, yeah. okay, they were about seven to nine inches long. Wow. And these nails were strong enough to actually hold Jesus on the cross, yeah. enough time to die for your sin. Wow. And so, you know, we're going to have these D groups right now. Mm-hmm. What sins did Jesus die on the cross for so that you don't have to die? Hate, pride, idols, greed, impurity, lust, jealousy, laziness, criticalness. In our D groups tonight, I want you to hammer away everything. Confess, repent, and nail it to the cross. Sisters, we are blessed to be warrior helpers. Have God be your greatest azer, own your role, and nail the enemy. I love you guys. To God be the glory.